Welcome, folks, to the second episode of Think Bad, Do Good, Attack IQ's new podcast. And today we are extremely pumped to have two leaders from the Chertoff Group, which is one of the world's leading cybersecurity and risk management consulting firms. We've got Adam Isles with us. He's a principal of the Chertoff Group. He's been working at, um, at Chertoff for the last decade, advising companies on cybersecurity risk. Uh, prior to that, he was at the Department of Homeland Security when it was just brand new advising the secretary as the deputy chief of staff, and he's a lawyer by training. He was at the Department of Justice for a long time. He was there during 9-11. I said you were at at DOJ during 9-11, Adam, is that right? That's right. Exactly right. Yep. And also um, uh, during Katrina. So he's seen a lot of crisis management experience, and companies are now benefiting from his expertise at Chertoff, where he oversees the the firm's cybersecurity offerings. Then we have Kurt Ayab. But I'm sorry, man. <laughs> I've, I've been rehearsing Kurt's name endlessly, endlessly. And I even lived in Turkey for three months. And you think I could pronounce a Turkish name well, but um, but I can't. So, Kurt, tell us your last name one more time. Alay Bey Olu, or just A10. See, see, now A10 is something Americans can say, but you think after practicing yeah, exactly. this, I could say your name. Uh, Alay Bey Olu. See, I got yeah. it. That's good. There you go. And podcast listeners can also hear my son chiming in from upstairs, which is great. It's like we're going to have a high-end conversation, but it's COVID-19, so here we are. Yeah, it's the realities of uh, work under COVID-19. Yes, exactly. So Kurt is like, so we have, so in this call, we've got two gentlemen with two very different backgrounds, but in very good complementary backgrounds for what the Chertoff Group does as it advises its um, clients on, on risk management. But Kurt was a, a, a cyber warfare officer in the U.S. Air Force. He spent a lot of time on the offensive side. He was on um, one of the combat mission teams within the Cyber Mission Force, which is, is readers of the blog will know there's three missions for uh, the Cyber Mission Force, and that's the offensive component. So he's got deep expertise in, um, in breaking into networks, understanding, defend, understanding how to get in, and then therefore understanding uh, how, to, how to secure a network from the outside. Um, so Kurt, and thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you. Um, so today, what we want to do is we're going to talk about we're going to talk about security control assurance and cybersecurity optimization, uh, and and a lot a lot also about about MITRE attack, um, and and how you validate that security controls are working. And both of these guys have they advise their clients and companies all over the world on on cybersecurity risk management. Um, so Adam, Adam, why don't we start with you? How does cybersecurity risk look to you from your seat? And what are the things that you keep in mind as you approach your clients? What are you trying to help them to do? You know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, cybersecurity is not a new risk, right? I mean, when I, you know, you talked about DOJ. Uh, when I started at DOJ in uh, the late 1990s, um, you know, there was a book called uh, The Cuckoo's Egg, right, that was required reading. It was actually copyrighted in 1989. It's basically about a cyber espionage uh, campaign to break into uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, right? Um, you know, and, and so what we've seen, right, um, is even back in the late 1990s, you had presidential decision directives that were trying to get a handle on both physical uh, and cyber uh, critical infrastructure protection. Um, but since then, right, technology has become even more ubiquitous than it already was, right? We live in a borderless uh, world, at least in, in cyberspaces, uh, with limited consequences and, you know, asymmetric opportunities for our adversaries. Mm -hmm. And so when we go into an organization, right, I mean, we're, we're, before we start talking about, okay, what controls do you have in place? We're actually trying to answer a couple of basic questions, right? Which is, Based on my business model, right? Who'd be coming after me? How would they do it? Uh, do my defenses actually map to likely threats? Does what I have in place actually work? And are we prepared if something goes wrong? Mm -hmm. Right? Those are the basic questions we're trying to address. Yep. Yep. Kurt, what about you? Is, does that jive to I your... Think that absolutely jives even from an from an operator's perspective. I mean, coming from a, a mission planning and, and ops focused background, uh, you know, you walk into your commander's office and, you know, the thing they want to know is what is your opponent's most likely and most dangerous co or courses of action. 
And um, the reason for that is because you have limited personnel, limited resources, limited time to execute. So you have to tamp down to what is in the universe of what do I care about and everything else is noise. Uh, I, I can't deal with it. So uh, by focusing on that, by looking at who are the most likely people to attack me, what have they done in the past, and those become, and then looking at, okay, not every TTP is the same, which ones are going to be your most likely, which ones are going to be the most dangerous, and how do I plan around that? Um, yep. We didn't, when I first came in from the, into the civilian world, I didn't see much of that sort of threat modeling this happening. This 2018, right? So you're, this yeah, is pretty recent transition period. Yep. So um, you didn't see a lot of that coming in? That no, was no. Uh, and that was, uh, and I mean, I had only had even a few, uh, a few assessments under my belt at the time and realized that this is this is something that was sorely needed and sorely needed and um, and there have been several uh, you know there have been books even written about this I mean Adam Shostak comes to mind from Microsoft he I mean he literally wrote the book on on threat modeling but but mostly on on the focusing on looking at your code and looking at threats from from a uh, developer's perspective uh, as opposed to a enterprise modeling perspective. Right. And I think part of that is also because until MITRE ATT&CK came into the fray and became as, as evolved as it was right now, it was kind of really hard to do that. Mm -hmm. Adam, have you seen a transition with the advent of MITRE ATT&CK with, with your clients focusing more on, on MITRE ATT&CK and known TTPs? How is this, how is this yeah, changing so, their behavior? So, you know, we've had, you know, a number of frameworks in place for a number of years and you know, a ton of spending, right? Almost, uh, well, I should say, you know, over $100 billion annually, right? In, in product and service related uh, cybersecurity spend. Um, and yet we still continue to see, you know, compromises um, uh, that are, uh, you know, kind of, you know, calamities for the organizations that are victimized by them. And so, and so what people are realizing, right, is, um, you know, to the extent that the conversation has historically been around vulnerabilities and vulnerability management, Right. That space, the attack surface is getting even more complex. Mm -hmm. Right. As we uh, you know, if, if you're a Fortune 100 company uh, in, in, in this country or, or abroad today, likely the reason you're uh, that large is because you've grown through mergers and acquisitions. Right. So you've got, you know, multiple complex, you know, IT environments that you bring together. Uh, source code's getting even more complex, uh, you know, than, than it was historically. You're seeing, you know, a, a proliferation of the use of open source, you know, third party code uh, and a lot of outsourcing as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So so like you've got this, you know, kind of almost naturally more complex um, attack surface. And when we start to think about threat, right, historically, you know, people have really been challenged to talk about threat beyond initial access. Right. People get the importance of defending against spear phishing. Um, you know, of, of um, you know, um, securing boundary defenses. The problem is inevitably, right, someone's going to click on a link, something is going to get through a filter, um, you know, some web server is going to be misconfigured, uh, there's going to be some external interface that doesn't two, have two-factor on it, and what happens then, right? And so mm -hmm. what we see a real focus on is... Uh, you know, whereas uh, historically, you know, kind of defining and modeling the universe of threats that could target an enterprise had been uh, subjective, particularly post initial access. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, whereas historically, you know, security guidance didn't neatly map, uh, you know, threats to control choices mm -hmm. or, or for that matter to validation and testing choices. MITRE kind of unlocks that. Yeah. I've, one of the things we're thinking a lot about is the idea of cybersecurity optimization, which is like, if you're a CISO at a, at a firm, for for last decade, there's been this increase in spending, but there's been, and you've, you've sort of reported to your board and to your, your leadership team saying, okay, I've patched the following things, we're compliant with this standard, but that's not actually a way to measure your effectiveness. And what we totally. want to get to is to be able to say like, you can report. You can report to the executive team of the board. And be like, our security controls are operating at, at maximum capacity at ninety five percent. We've identified the following yeah. gaps. This is what we're going to do to mitigate them. And and then under a budget constrained environment, you want to be able to say, I've rationalized and I've measured all of my tools to say this is worth the money. Are you hearing folks talk like that? Yeah. So so let's talk about that. Let's let's unpack that a little mm -hmm. bit. All right. So, so, right. If you're an executive, right, you're not going to be focused on a specific vulnerability, a specific TTP. You're not going to understand that, mm -hmm. but you are going to say, all right, look, based on my business model, 
what should I consider as reasonably foreseeable threat actor interest in, in me, in my organization's you know, critical processes and data? So you can use the attack framework, right? And, you know, we supplement it with additional information to map <clears throat> business objectives to threat actor types uh, that would be likely to target those. You can then also use the framework to map threat actor groups to the tactics, techniques, and procedures uh, that they would, uh, you know, they're known to have used. And, and you can supplement it as well. Because once you get down to the level of tactics, techniques, and procedures, that's where you're able then to um, map uh, to defensive countermeasures. Because I can map, and, and, and Kurt can explain this in, in much more detail, but I can map a TTP to a defensive countermeasure, particularly post-initial access. Mm -hmm. um, and so now all of a sudden I've got, all right, who's coming after me? How would they do it? What would they use? What do I have to defend against uh, you know, that kind of activity? And I can start to identify you know, whether I have coverage gaps uh, or conversely, whether a targeted investment would give me you know, kind of outsized coverage against uh, the threat model that I've mm -hmm. now developed using a MITRE attack. So it can, so, lead, to, or it can lead to an ROI uh, analysis. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So, so one, one of the things that, you know, in the past you were mentioning about uh, different frameworks and, and about compliance, uh, CISOs measuring by compliance. And one of the things every, every, which is good. I'm not trying to say don't be compliant, no, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are, there are legal and regulatory reasons to be compliant for certain things, but every security professional will tell you that compliance is not security. And, uh, and so one of the things um, that uh, attack has has allowed people to do is is to be able to go through and say are my controls actually effective it, it gives you a universe to draw from to be able to look at everything and say okay now that i know these groups are interested in me now that i know here's the history of ttps they've used now i can go and say all right what controls do i have in place uh in order to test them? and then i can start using um, automated controls assurance platforms uh, like Attack IQ to be able to go in and say, okay, I'm going to run scenarios X, Y, and Z. Huh, wait a minute. I failed this. Why did I fail this? So I, I'm supposed to have this EDR in place, this IDS here, and it allows you to go into a depth to be able to say, hmm, ah, now I see. Uh, the logs that I thought were being forwarded to my EDR aren't there, or the detection logic that I have uh, for that has a flaw in it, and I can start testing it and then turn around and say, all right, Let's test again, um, because that's one of the things up until now uh, has been missing is that you haven't been able to test what you have. But I think that there's, an, there's another point um, that lays on top of that, right, which is that in an, in an era of limited resources, right, we talked earlier about return on investment. <laughs> Not all TTPs are created equal. So, right, so we're, <clears throat> we're kind of necking down the environment from the universe of anything that anyone could conceivably do to here's what starts to be a little bit more reasonably foreseeable. And then within that category, we start to try to understand, okay, within the realm of what is reasonably foreseeable, it's what Kurt said earlier on, right? What's most likely and most dangerous? So how do I start to think about uh, risk rating uh, individual TTPs, mm -hmm. right? And, and this is part of what, what um, you know, um, Kurt's innovation, you know, within our practice has revolved around. Yeah, that's interesting. Why don't you tell us tell us a little bit about that and what makes you guys different in your approach? Sure. Um, so a, a little bit on what we've done, um, starting back, and, and this starts with a bit of a story. Back in 2018, when I first started on on my first assessment, um, it, it was a, a massive corporation, and you know, trying to wrap my head around how I'm going to actually assess some assess something so big, as opposed um, to and, breaking things on behalf of the U.S. government. Yeah. Yeah, yeah or, or breaking into individual endpoints or securing mm -hmm. uh, hardening endpoints, etc. Um, and and my my thought, one of the interviews that I had with the, the lead security architect is where he said, you know, he paid the million some odd dollars uh, for this anti DDoS uh, uh, protection device, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it, it took about six months of browbeating for the network uh, network engineers to actually even get them to place it on the network. And when they did, instead of putting it in front of the core router as was needed to be able to defend it, they put it on a span port on the side, uh, which effectively made it useless. But you're compliant. The the uh, the control is in place. Um, but then you go and say, well, there's the traffic. There it goes. I can't do anything about it. And so my thought was after that, 
there needs to be a way to be able to test. But then the question is asked, well, how do you prioritize what you test? Well, right then on, on AttackCon, uh, the first AttackCon in 2018, um, Travis Smith gave a gave a speak uh, a talk on the teach model, which goes on basically uh, difficulty of exploitation. Uh, how hard is it to actually execute a TTP? Well, at the same time, I had actually worked internally to develop a well. How difficult is it to defend against uh, a TTP? And that ranges from uh, what is uh, essentially basic hygiene down to your mileage may vary down to, hey, there's really no mitigation you can do on this because it uses actual, you know, it abuses operating system functions. And so if you try to block it, you will break things that are actually supposed to work. So the best thing you can do is detect. And so what we then start to do is we, we melded these two things together to look and say, okay, let's focus on what is what is most likely and what I can actually do something about mm -hmm. and most likely ends up being oh, more often than not, how easy is it? I mean, a, attacker, maybe this is just me, but as an attacker, I'm lazy. If I can, if I can use something that's weaponized, that's, you know, a Metasploit exploit, as opposed to, you know, writing my own script or executable, I'm going to use the exploit that's already available. That's and a really I good point, actually. Like, just to pause on that for a second, because... If you're one of the most highly trained, you know, cyber warfare officers in the U.S. Air Force, and that's coming from you saying you're going to use the easiest thing most available, that tells us something about adversaries in general. I, I mean, I, I, I would defer Using to you on that. Example case of one, a case of one. Are, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say that there are people, uh, you know, much more advanced than I, but, um, but mm -hmm. even even they, in in having talked with them, you know, while I was doing that work, was. There, you know, general general rule is, man, don't reinvent the wheel. I mean, if it's there and and it's available, use it. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and so by focusing on those, we can turn around and basically create a TTP by TTP priority level, and then we can then so we can then criticality weight them, and be able to provide that information, be able to say here are the things. So here's your threat model within that threat model. Here are the things you should prioritize. Here are the things that you should probably eh, focus a little less on and then start testing. And then, then you can start really narrowing down what your efforts are gonna be. So you can narrow down based on, hey, what fixes can I make that's gonna provide the most bang for buck across my threat model? And also what fixes can I make that focuses on those top criticality TTPs? And um, testing controls platforms allows you to do that um, at a level of automation and, um, and, and depth that you didn't have before. I mean, because, I mean, pen tests are great. Red teaming is great, um, but they're manually, they're difficult. They're manually intensive. Uh, they require a lot of personnel hours to accomplish. Um, and unless you have very well scoped down rules of engagement as to what you're trying to get out of that. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you may walk away with not really understanding what it is exactly you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and this allows you to be able to kind of test it. It democratizes the ability to test um, by, by shortening that pipeline of instead of needing a full blown red teamer, which will take I mean, eight years of experience, nine years of experience and training to maybe get to that level. It now allows your junior analysts to be able to, you know, push play, yeah. analyze and, and go. And even a red team, I mean, a red team would maybe if you do a, a once annual audit, they get three assets out of 800. That doesn't tell you anything about the overall health of the enterprise. And so one of the things that I was very attracted to attack IQ because of the scale capability, like you can quickly scale adversary emulations and run them against run them against an enterprise. And the interesting thing about it is like it's a new market, right? Like it there was a study there was a study that was done, I can't remember who it was. I shouldn't guess because then I'll give credit to the wrong organization, but um, um, that said breach and attack simulation in terms of in terms of growing IT markets is up there with big data and AI in terms of a space. So within cybersecurity like cybersecurity overall has this massive spend. But folks have begun to recognize that if you can automate adversary behavior through a, a platform. Um, so I'm glad to hear that it's useful for you, obviously. Like, oh, look, yeah, 100%. Yeah. I mean, so, so you go back to <clears throat> you go back to, to enterprise risk management, security risk management over the decades. And there are three foundational planks, right? Um, you assess, 
uh, you in most cases mitigate, sometimes you accept, sometimes you transfer, sometimes you avoid, but let's just focus on mitigation. And then you monitor what you've mitigated to make sure that it's actually operating as intended. And the monitoring piece is where people so often fall down, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's, I've got something in place, Kurt talked about it earlier, uh, does it actually work? Mm-hmm. Um, one of the, you know, one of the things I'll always remember it from, from being at, at the Department of Homeland Security uh, in the mid 2000s was uh, Hurricane Katrina. Um, and, you know, we had a situation where I mean, the hurricane was, was, a, it was a nasty event, but it was the flooding of the city of New Orleans after the fact uh, that uh, was a, a national catastrophe. Um, and, and key to that, right, was the fact that, uh, you know, the 17th Street Canal levee and, and others like it were, were breached at some point. That levee had been built in the early 1990s and had never been inspected uh, between the time that it had been built and the time that it was breached in August of 2005. And we see that. Um, what year was too it built? Often. Did you say? In the early 1990s, I think 1991. Mm-hmm. Um, but but so right, which which you want to see whether we're talking about infrastructure, whether we're talking about technology, is a level of validation, right, of controls assurance that the thing you think is in place is as strong as it's supposed to be uh, and is uh, is operating as intended. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. I mean. And, yeah, and, 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 and to your point, right, look, there's, there's testing, there's audit, but how do you scale that, right? How do you scale that ac- across, um, you know, the, the number of organizations that are out there that are exposed, that have data, uh, you know, that have, you know, compute power, uh, you know, that someone wants to subvert? Yeah, and doing it at scale safely and in production, right? Like you, you want to be able to do all those things and that, that gives you an advantage. Um, you know, it's interesting, like, so I, I worked in national security prior to coming here and still, I guess I still am in national security, right? Um, cybersecurity is a little bit of national security that way. It's interesting. But in military culture, after 9-11 and, and after every crisis, we sort of measure how can we get ahead of threats? How can we prepare for them? And one of the things about the military that I love so much is you have to exercise constantly for it. And with the thing, the other thing that I like about this platform is that you can, you can run validation test quickly as many times as you want per day against against whoever you have it aligned against for to test your security controls which is just so important so you can you can really measure it so 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 the other piece in addition to measuring that becomes important and you would understand this from a national security point of view is that it like it kind of takes a village right and so you you actually as, as you go through the cycle of risk management right you see multiple teams coming together um and uh, what what attack does and, and where you know validation fits in is in providing a common language common data that multiple teams can use right common so, taxonomy. so yeah. yeah common taxonomy exactly right so so now what I can do is I can start by looking at inherent risk I can bring my risk team my business continuity team in the business to say all right from an impact point of view what are we most worried about I can bring you know my you know, uh, a threat team or outside expertise to help me translate that into, you know, threat actors, TTPs. Um, so now I'm starting to think about defensive countermeasures. Mm-hmm. All right, let me bring security engineering in, right, mm-hmm. to help with that. Okay, what are we going to test? Mm-hmm. Now I need to go back to my business continuity team, right, um, uh, the, the business, my risk team to try and start focusing on that. And then what do we do about it? And so what, what, what attack does, right, as, as Kurt mentioned, is it starts to offer a common taxonomy mm-hmm. to communicate around a threat across teams in a way that had been uh, stovepiped uh, beforehand. Yeah, that's right. I mean, so it gives you, it helps you validate your security and, and make your security more effective. And then it also helps you say, where, where do I need to fill gaps, either on my teams yep. or in my technology? Um, is Are my investments panning out? And, and the thing that I really love the most is this, like, the ability to report get effectiveness against the baseline of TTPs to be like, we've tested against the following TTPs and we, this, we can so say this how is, effective we are. I this is risk-based that, effectiveness. Yeah. yeah. And I think that goes, also goes back to the, to the common taxonomy piece because you, it allows you to create these sort of crisp, concise reporting and making sure that everyone is on the same page. So when you're talking about initial access, when you're talking about discovery, when you're talking about these individual tactics and then going down into the TTPs, the attacker accomplished execution through PowerShell or via PowerShell. The attacker did X by Y. Having that common taxonomy is not just important within an organization because 
words matter. Um, but it's also important across an industry because now you've got uh, whole uh, whole areas like you've got uh, IDSs and IPSs uh, measuring their showing showing their detections via against attack PIDs against technique IDs. You've got EDRs that are mapping themselves like what TTPs they are effective against based on uh, based on uh, MITRE attack. You've got all of these different, you've got the whole kind of cybersecurity industry rallying around because this is something that has been sorely needed because too many people have been saying the same thing in too many different ways. And this is, uh, and it has led to things like vendor over promise because a vendor can say one thing and and then the developers of said, uh, of said product could be like, no, that's not what I meant when I said X. Well, mm-hmm. now you eliminate that, uh, that confusion. And when you're going out, when you're looking at different items, you know exactly what widget X is going to protect you against. And all you need to do now is measure, okay, how well does it perform in mm-hmm. those functions? Yeah, which is why I think the, 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 the MITRE attack evaluations are so positive for vendors. They can say, like, we've baselined our, our capabilities against MITRE attack, and, and now we come out and we can say, this is how well we did. I think it's terrific. It's really good. It, it provides a way of, of assessing vendors, too. Um, it's, you know, it's like we all have been working in cybersecurity now for 10 plus years, each of us. And we've seen this tremendous growth, whether it's from the cyber mission force and Kurt and my standpoint or on the capability side in the commercial sector, Adam, uh, and now me too, right? All of us um, seen this tremendous growth in expenditure. And now we can finally say, like, we're going to close the circle and say, is it working as best as it can? We're now providing a capability to say, this is like, the overall feedback yeah. loop for all the investments you made. It's not an insurance policy because insurance is its own thing, but it's like we're now going to prove to, we're now going to prove that everything is working as it should. Um, which yeah, is- I mean, so you know, the, the day we eliminate cyber risk is the day we eliminate crime, right? I mean, it's always going to be out there. So well, <clears throat> risk elimination is impossible, and so this really becomes a question around risk based effectiveness. Yeah, right. Am, am, is is what I'm? Am I taking? reasonable actions against a reasonably foreseeable threat. Yeah, that's a great quote. I'm definitely going to use that. The day we eliminate cyber risk is the day we eliminate crime. That's good. You make a good speech writer, Adam. <laughs> oh, I've plagiarized, right? So. <laughs> you heard it here first. I think bad, do good. <laughs> um, Kurt, you know, you, yeah, go ahead, Adam, please. Uh, well, the other thing I was going to say is I, I think you know, looking back, I mean, uh, DHS, um, you know, one of the largest civilian transformations since World War II. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that um, it kind of, you know, principles that, that Michael Chertoff, you know, drove into the department uh, as, as it was being transformed was everyone was going to operate on a, on a risk basis, right? Mm-hmm. It was really about risk management, uh, regardless of which component uh, we, we were talking about. And we, you know, we tried to reflect back on all the transformation that occurred during that time period and say, all right, what are the foundational principles that need to be in an effective security program? Uh, and, and, and we focused on three, right? The first, like, duh, is that it needs to be risk-based. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the second is that it needs to be what we refer to as trusted, right? And this speaks to controls assurance. This speaks to testing validation, right? Things are operating as intended. The third piece is that it needs to be intuitive. And, and I think that that can also be something that, that escapes, uh, you know, um, the, the stakeholders at, at multiple levels. Mm-hmm. And this is where I think, you know, automation at the level of, uh, you know, controls validation becomes important. But it also becomes important at a senior level, mm-hmm. right? So, like, you know, you know this, Kurt knows this, you know, maybe I, I, I know what effectiveness looks like. But the people that are funding this activity, the people that are accountable to, you know, shareholders, or to customers or to regulators, uh, maybe um, don't appreciate it this as much. And so I think you know another part of what becomes important is to think about how to translate these results into a metric that actually speaks to security performance, right? And you know you think about it, right? Um, you know we, we we all, or at least most of us, have applied for a mortgage or a car loan, right? You know we 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 know what the score we get back is, and we want to see a, you know a seven seventy. Uh, you know, not a, uh, you know, a, a 510. Five, 510, yeah. Or in your exactly. case, uh, an A10, correct? <clears throat> yeah, or in my case, yeah. It's only. <laughs> but what, you know, what, what becomes pretty stark, right, when you have these conversations, and that's, you know, that's um, what part of what Kurt's built is, 
you can go into an organization and you can show them two different environments mm -hmm. and you can show one environment, you know, that's performing at a, at a 750 or a 760. Okay. Right. And then you can go to another environment and you can see that, you know, control hasn't been, uh, you know, properly integrated and you can see performance down at a 480. Mm -hmm. And when people see that, it, it, like there's, um, there isn't a whole lot of debate right around, okay, yeah. we need to deal with this uh, immediately. Mm -hmm. I love this. Um, I mean, you being there at the starting of DHS in a in a tense national political moment, right after nine eleven, like the country sort of totally shocked. We've had a couple of shocks since then, right? The global financial crisis, the pandemic, Katrina. Um, I love the the way you broke that down. What was it? It was uh, it started with intuitive, and then um, well, risk risk based, intuitive, and trusted. Risk-based, intuitive, and trusted. I like that a lot. It's like it gives you clear principles, you know, because like one of the things about the world that we know is like there's complexity everywhere and we're drowning in data. If you're a CISO, like particularly in a large organization, you've got all these different sub, sub departments and like everyone has, you know, there's different levels of complexity with personnel and technology. You want to make things simple as you like try and improve effectiveness overall. I really like that formulation. Yeah. And that actually that actually came from kind of like a, a offhand comment um, because you know originally when I was designing the visualizations for this you know the turnaround was that's great how do we uh, how do we present this to a board and you know my initial thought is well everyone understands you know a test score zero to one hundred that seems mm -hmm. you know simple enough but then I mean you already know that no one's going to be getting 100s on this. This isn't, this isn't like your, uh, you know, eight, eighth grade history test or, or math test or something. It, it, the, the weighting is going to be pretty, pretty low or in, in the middle. If you get seventies or eighties, Hey, that's, that's great. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it doesn't really provide the, the level of, of depth required. And ironically, as I was, you know, talking this out, out loud to myself, our, our, our CEO, Chad Sweet, was walking by, he was listening to me talk, he turned around and said to me, you should make it a credit score, or rather like a risk score, something along those lines. Yeah. And uh, I and I, at first I, I laughed it off. And then uh, I said, well, you know what, that's, that's not a bad idea. Uh, if I can use something that's similar to that, as, as Adam said, most everyone has has you know applied for a loan of some sort. Everyone wants to see uh, see the you know everyone recognizes those numbers. Um, that would be a great way to take uh, to explain security risk to someone uh, who's not necessarily a security professional. Um, yeah. And and how we how we actually explain that is um, you know one of the interesting things is. Uh, you know, as, as we mentioned, as Adam mentions, like some areas you see like a 480, uh, sometimes you see this, you know, sea of red that often tends to scare people. Let me, and we let actually, me pause you for, pause you for one second. I'm, my yeah. battery is going to die. So what I'd like to do, I'm going to, I'm going to get my power cord, but, um, okay. talk about, talk for a second to the audience about how customers have benefited from that. Explain like how, yeah, some of the feedback folks have given you. Yeah. Um, so so as I was as I was going through and saying that, um, so we we measure uh, we measure these into two different ways. Um, one of the things that we've seen is that people get scared of this sort of sea of red uh, that they see, and uh, one of the things that we take into account when we do the assessment is that um, an attacker doesn't accomplish uh, these uh, attack these TTPs in a vacuum. Um, there's a little bit of artificiality to controls assurance testing, and so. Um, what we try and take into account the fact that when we do these assessments is that in the course of, uh, of a test or in the course of an actual campaign, there's a logical, there's a logical step of kill chain, Lockheed Martin kill chain, uh, kind of moving from initial access to persist to execution and persistence and attack actually pretty much covers this from left to right in their, in their tactics categories, totally. ranging all the way down to exfiltration of data or impact. And so um, we take into account the fact that because this is a purple teaming exercise, essentially, I mean, we're working with uh, blue teams. This isn't a, this isn't a stump the chump, hey, we got you kind of deal. This is meant to improve. Um, and so what we, what we try to look at is, okay, this is how you did 
but where is the first detection that a human analyst would have put eyes on and would have initiated incident response and then would have started triage and containment and, uh, and eradication? Uh, because then you can start to see, okay, here's how you do as a whole, but you caught your, detection, your first detection that would have started incident responses right here in this category. And so now what that allows you to say is, now you can take everything from there and to, to the right of that, now that you've started incident response, containment, triage, et cetera, now you can say that, okay, yeah, I, I did poorly down there, um, but I detected early and I responded. So now I can show kind of two different scores to say that, yeah, all, all told, I didn't do so well, but we caught them really early and we moved on it fast. Yeah. And so we actually did not too bad. Um, and so it allows it allows organizations to to kind of really gauge how well they're doing in detection, how well they're doing in protection. Um, yeah, which so, are yeah. two very so different I, areas. Kurt, Kurt, I so I talk a little bit though about for those clients who have scored lower, some of the insights they go, oh wow, I didn't realize that. Yeah, um, that this is generated, and and the ability to show someone from a return on investment point of view. Look, if you do this thing, it could actually um, drive your score potentially as high as X. Yeah. Because right? we have so, those use cases. Yeah. So one of the things, um, kind of go back to another story time, was uh, in, in one of the clients that we were assessing that when we did this, um, in, in earlier conversations, they had stated, oh, we don't need to worry about PowerShell in our environment. We have a GPO in place. Um, PowerShell doesn't run. Uh, unless you're an administrator in, in XYZ in particular buckets. And so I said, hmm, okay. And I quickly wrote a one-liner in the middle of the Zoom call, kind of like we're sitting right now, and I asked them to run this. And I said, please, show me what happens. And PowerShell opened up on their box uh, because the GPO is not really a, a protective function. It, it, it's an administrative function to, to kind of lock down. And so uh, one of the things that we were able to show because they had this false sense of security on there, was able to say, look, many of the techniques that we ran with Attack IQ when we did our assessment all generate and run through PowerShell. And one of the things that you could engage in is PowerShell module logging. So one of the great things about your environment is you have a GPO in place. You've already stated unique to you that no one should be running PowerShell. That's great. Because now, with in combination with that, you can turn around and say, if I turn on even the most, the least verbose form of logging and send that to the sim, now I know every time something pops up with PowerShell associated to that, I can already uh, suspect uh, malice. I can already suspect that it's going to be a malicious action because no one's supposed to be running it. Um, and so, and and we were able to show. Hey, not just PowerShell, but here are all the other TTPs that you can do with PowerShell that now you can, you have the sort of oversized return on investment from the control that you've now put in place compared to uh, the amount of, uh, the amount of protection you've now given. That's you know, awesome. We have other clients that, that aren't able to implement a PowerShell GPO, right? Just not going to work in their, in their environment. Mm -hmm. And yes, so I they're, right. They very you know, that that's where you, and so there you can say all right <clears throat> you know we we don't have an EDR right here's the potential coverage we'd be able to get uh, where we'd have one or we do have one but oh crap you know is, is it integrated actually with the sim in the way we wanted to right and so mm -hmm. you can show those differentials in score mm -hmm. um, in a in a before and potentially after context that's awesome I like to use um I think I'm kind of alone in the company sometimes about this but I'm, I'm I like to talk about the Fitbit as an analogy, because it's not just like, you're not just measuring your steps, right? You're actually measuring how well your exercise is doing. Are you driving down your heart rate? Like I like my goal is to get mine down to like 49 or 48, which is like a good thing. It's not there. It's a, like, well, it's at 53, 54 right now, which is good. That's but like, bad. it's pretty good, right? Yeah. Anyway, I'm yeah. not, bra I'm not using this as a chance to brag, right? That's not why I'm here. Um, but the, like, I just, it's transformative to be able to say, to be able to, to, to determine like what you just talked about, like that's new and transformative. And for folks in the, in, who are new to cybersecurity, they may just sort of expect that. I mean, like one of those things that kept happening to me in, in, in my career is like, 
I always sort of expected the government to be doing something that it wasn't. And then when somebody mm-hmm. launched a new initiative, I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, aren't you already doing that? And people are like, no, we haven't done this before. Um, well, it's great. It's awesome to hear you guys. Like you, there's such richness in your brains and we've barely scratched the surface. I mean, I've got all these questions that we could spend a long time talking to Kurt about like what it was like breaking things for the government. I think it would be a short conversation because you probably can't talk about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, but Kurt, any last thoughts before uh, before we pivot over to, over to Adam to wrap us up? Yeah, so I think one of the interesting things is that for the longest time in in cybersecurity, is it's always been kind of offense has kind of outweighed defense, mm-hmm. um, and and we've kind of played catch up in terms of being able to you know every time something new comes out, it's like antivirus comes out with a new, uh, with a new signature afterwards. EDR comes with new uh, detection algorithms for it afterwards. I think with, um, with the rise, as you said, the growth of automation control of uh, controls assurance platforms, I think we're actually kind of at an inflection point now Mm -hmm. um, because we've, we've allowed the, the you know junior analysts and and essentially uh, like the trigger pullers to be to de- democratize that skill to be able to then turn around and say now um, even if I'm not the you know the red team or the pen tester even though even if I'm not uh, an OSCP or, or I have these levels of skills I, I can now hmm. take at, at a simplistic level deploy an agent run these scenarios and get a result and then start digging from there and allow to bring meaningful change uh, to an organization, even if it's slow. I mean, even if it's only putting controls that are technique by technique, at least it can now be measured, it can be tracked, and we can start really turning the tables um, on, uh, on, a lot of the, on a lot of the lack of data and, and lack of visibility that we had before. Yeah, I mean, it gives you data, right? Like one of the things that it, it gives you data about your exposure. One, yeah. You made a great point that I haven't heard or talked about before, which I, I would love to pull like a little bit of a string on. Sorry, Adam, like before we pivot back to you. Um, no worries. The idea that, thank you, Adam. The idea that uh, you have defenders previously who had to be highly, highly, highly trained. Did I just hear you right that you said like with an, with an automated platform, Defenders don't have to have the same level of capability that maybe they would previously, so that you yes. could then put your higher, more highly trained defenders onto more niche capabil- defensive capabilities, so that you can have not like grunts running your defensive capability on the blue team, but like because you have the automated emulation, you don't. It doesn't require quite as much technical expertise. Is that what you're saying? So, yeah, yeah. So so it allows for taking the junior analyst to be able to say run the test and then junior you're analyst, more senior, that's polite. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and then your more senior analysts who maybe have more experience have more training under their belt to be able to analyze those results and to be able to provide more effective countermeasures that can then propagate across the network um, that instead of you know having someone try and muddle about and, and learn that way is that now you have people who can be dedicated to running the tests and then you can have your your more senior folks who can understand what those controls mean, what the results mean on those mm-hmm. tests, be able to then turn around and make meaningful meaningful changes across the network or across an enterprise. I love that point from an, from a cyber workforce standpoint, which is something I hadn't thought about. That's a really good point. Cool. It helps cut that cut that training tail. Hmm. Yeah. Adam, how about you? you? Got last thoughts for us? Yeah, I'll leave you with three points. Right. The first of which is we're in a time of tremendous change. Right. You think about what COVID nineteen has done to the work environment. Um, you think about um, you know as much disruption as we've seen in our economy. There are also certain sectors, healthcare logistics, you know, uh, manufacturing, I'd say finance as well, that really need to work. Um, and we have really volatile situations, right, both uh, domestically and internationally. Um, and, and, and that will continue. Um, and so you, you worry about, you know, um, uh, internal uh, frustrations, you know, turning outward. And so it's never been more important to have a lock on, particularly as we're changing security controls, right, on kind of on the, on the fly a little bit. Mm-hmm to make sure that, that what we have in place uh, is actually operating as intended, right? Mm-hmm. So um, that's point one. 
Uh, point two is I think as we start to um, you know generate more data around this, I do think that there's a play uh, uh, for for a much more informed insurance underwriting discussion right around all right look. Um, we have risk-based effectiveness, right? We have strong security performance and we've got data that shows it's trending the right way over time. That should mean something, right? For, um, you know, the kind of capacity, um, you know, the, the, the nature of perils that are covered, uh, et, et cetera. Um, and I, I, I'm excited to see an evolution in that space. I do also think, uh, you know, as, as this becomes more broadly adopted, you start to get some really bench, interesting benchmarking data. Right, and that I start to be able to say, okay, in my industry group, um, you know, how are we doing, right? Um, and and that becomes really important for for boards, right, to to understand, uh, you know, reasonableness. Um, but I th I think um, this is an exciting time for us, right? I mean, it's a it's a perilous time, but it's exciting to see the opportunity to get at you know the, this fundamental question around effectiveness with a degree of transparency, accuracy, and precision that we just haven't had before. That was beautifully said, man. Couldn't, no one, you know, be hard pressed to hear okay. anyone say it better. Um, gosh, it's really great to have both of you on. I told you this before um, when, we, when we've spoken in the past, but it's such a, it's an honor to be able to work with both of you and talk to both of you and, and learn from your expertise. And um, I know that the audience is gonna benefit from it. Um, uh, so thank you. Thank you both very much for coming on the show. Thank you, thank you for having us. Thanks. Yeah. So the more I do this, the more I realize how little I know. So it, um, it's, it, the, the honor is mutual. So thank yeah. you. Cool. Good. Well, come on again and uh, look forward to working with you more.